All right. Welcome, everyone, to our TDLJS Interest Group webinar today. Um, Catherine Strickland and I, both from UT Austin, will be covering the topic of developing a 3D interactive model of the Perry Castaneda Library map room, or PCL map room, as we'll be uh, calling it throughout this session today. Uh, really glad to have you here. And uh, we're a few minutes past the hour, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Just as a quick reminder, this session is being recorded, um, and the recording will be posted. So please keep that in mind as you're asking questions, uh, but please do ask questions. Uh, definitely would love to um, you know, tell you more about this and uh, answer anything that we can uh, that you might be curious about. So um, yeah, feel free to, to interject as we're going along to, um, so we can uh, make sure that uh, we address those questions as they are uh, relevant to what we're discussing. And uh, we'll also have time for questions at the end today. Great, thanks, right, Michael. Well, I think we can go ahead and get started. Cool. So I'm going to kick this off. My name is Catherine Strickland. I'm the Maps Coordinator at the UT Libraries, and I oversee the PCL Map Collection. I've been working in the Map Room with the Map Collection for over 13 years, and all great things start as a solution to a problem. So I'm going to give you a little background on why we wanted this. If I can get my slide. Ah, there we go. Uh, so at, since I've worked in this room, one of my biggest concerns is wayfinding. Um, there are 1,189 drawers of maps. There are 19 different types of maps. And with that, 19 different call numbers. We have government document call numbers, which are inherently confusing, um, I believe. and house call numbers, and of course, uh, LC call numbers. So tons of different call numbers. When I came into the position, there was only a printed stack guide uh, that I have a screenshot of in a second, but you basically alphabetical order looked up a place, and then it gave you a ton of information, like which drawer, what the call number range is. Uh, one solution that I've tried is a map of the map room, which is what you see to the right here, um, that was, it's great, great start. But I think the, the map of the map room also illustrates how confusing the map room is, all the different call numbers and color coding. Um, and another thing I've always been cognizant of is that many patrons visit on weekends when I'm not here to help them. Um, occasionally we'd have some students that would be here, but not often. So this is a snapshot of the room as it is now. The entrance used to be different, but this is the room now. Um, and that's a little overwhelming if you're looking for one piece of paper. So in the room, we have labels and this correlated with the stack guide that we used to have. Each drawer is numbered and it has a little bit of a description. So these are navigational charts got uh, the call number. So if somebody looked in the catalog and had a call number and we're looking for a map, we've got the call number there. Um, to your right, you'll see the room when I tried to color code the navigational charts, then had blue codes. That's one way to help like parking garage wayfinding. Uh, this is what the map, the PCL map guide work. Can you see my mouse? Um, great. So, you know, if somebody was looking for maps of Greenland, it tells them it's in drawer 78, gives you a call number range. Um, this doesn't address any other maps of Greenland we have that might be, we have uh, road maps from around the world that are folded in a different section. So that doesn't address that. This just deals with the LC call numbers, gazetteers, et cetera. So even though it's a, it was a robust guide, it was limiting. Um, when I started working here, I redid the labels to make give them a little bit in, more information. And in the guide to the PCL map collection, I felt the need to have <laughs> uh, something to, to tell people what the labels were, like where the drawer number they're looking for, place name, et cetera. So another solution we tried this with more recent Thanks to the courtesy of Freck, which um, is technology, technology, technolo oh my gosh, Michael, you're gonna have to help Thank me with that. Resources. So, so, um, their location service 
that handles all the mapping on cam campus also do Matterport scans, which are like walkthroughs. Um, one case they, they use them a lot is so students can see what the dorm rooms look like. So they can actually kind of tour the dorm room. Um, and then so that they made a Matterport scan of the map room, but it was super limiting. The, there are a few limitations. Like I can't show you the walkthrough because there were students studying and we didn't get signed release releases from them. And um, I'm unable to blur their faces. Another limiting feature or a limitation with it is these points, these blue points in here are kind of where you can add data. So I could do that for some things like this one talks about travel guides that gives my office information. But if I were to tell people about just just telling about the 19 different types of maps. That's 19 of these giant blue dots that are that big when you're walking through. So it's not, not a really elegant way to send information and it doesn't give them much information. Enter the inspiration for this project. In 2021, I was at the Western Association of Map Libraries Conference. It was online. Um, and my colleague at Arizona State University, Matthew Turo, presented on a project that they were working on and almost finished with. So we got a sneak preview of it. It's the dream finding aid, I think, for all librarians. Um, so I'm going to give you a demo of it. And I'll give you a little bit more background as I'm doing the demo. Let me escape. Oh, here I have a loaded version. So this, you see a beautiful rendering of the Map and Geospatial Hub, which is their name, the name for their map collection. Um, they have basically geolocated every single map in their collection. So if you click on a drawer, you see this pop up. It gives you the drawer number, much like our labels. Um, how many maps are in the drawer and it will actually give you an item list of what's in the drawer. So you can actually look at the maps, see spatially in the room where they are, um, the images, they're working on having an image of the actual map, uh, but look at the catalog. This is an amazing, amazing feat. This one in 2022 S3, um, Special Achievements and GIS Award. It's an amazing, amazing finding aid. I will note that four or three full-time staff members, one full-time intern and two GRAs took over a year to complete this. Um, also while in lockdown, so they had less distractions. Uh, so this took a lot of work and a lot of amazing work. And it was also, simply a brilliant idea. Um, so this was the insp inspiration. And I remember coming back from that conference, well, the next time I met with Michael and telling him about it and asking if it was possible for us to do something like this. It's the dream finding aid. And we were both kind of, it was a pie in the sky. Like, yes, maybe one day we'll get to work on this. About a year later, uh, the head of our library reached out to Michael because he, the, the, you know, when they won the um, special achievement in GIS award from S3, they're the company that makes ArcGIS, which is um, kind of one of the largely largest used geospatial GIS software. Um, she sent it to Michael and asked him, we have this. We discussed it again, and we were like, we do not have the bandwidth for this, um, but maybe we could find students that can help us with this, or, you know, it'd be a capstone project or a special project with students. And next, I'm going to pass it to you, Michael. All right. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Hopefully everybody can see 
our next slide. So I want to talk a little bit more about this uh, opportunity that we had come up last fall, coincidentally, right after we had uh, heard from our um, director and vice provost of the ET libraries uh, here uh, about an interest in developing something similar to what uh, ASU um, had developed for their uh, map room, as we just saw demonstrated. And uh, as Catherine mentioned, we really didn't you know, see any way that we would have the bandwidth to take on a project like this on our own, uh, both being you know, very busy with all, all the other projects that we are already committed to, right? So we were really interested in it. Obviously, we could see the value. Um, it is very exciting to, to have that capability, of course, to allow folks to virtually visit a space in your library and to uh, be able to both explore and search for specific things they might be interested in finding. And, you know, we at the time, I think this was last August, almost exactly a year ago, you know, we, we mentioned, uh, you know, we'll we'll keep an eye out, you know, for any way that we might be able to um, find the capacity to explore developing something like this for the UT libraries. Coincidentally, just a few weeks later, uh, I happened to learn about uh, a capstone project program uh, that is something that occurs every year um, within our uh, Master's of Science and in Information Technology and Management program here at UT Austin. And what happens every year around the start of the academic year, uh, the students in that program are uh, tasked with finding a capstone project that they work on as a team uh, in order to satisfy one of the requirements for their master's of science degree. And I happened to learn about this program just a few weeks before uh, the students were supposed to select their project. And so there was really almost no time at all to put together a proposal for a project we might um, invite students to work on. But uh, what we, we learned after speaking with the program director is that the way the program typically works uh, in a given year, there are businesses and organizations um, and occasionally uh, folks uh, at UT who will propose projects that are good learning opportunities for students in this uh, information technology and management program. So IT focused, uh, really focused on managing data, managing technical infrastructure in order to achieve um, a new business solution or address a particular business need. And uh, Catherine and I uh, spoke about this and realized that we had a very you know, short window of time to come up with a proposal that might appeal to students in this program uh, that you know, would need to be properly scoped such that they have enough to work on over the course of the spring semester in order to satisfy the requirements for their degree. Uh, we didn't want them to have too little to work on, but it couldn't be too much. Uh, it also had to be technically appropriate so that it would allow them to utilize the skills that they've learned in the program. And what we ended up uh, coming up with were three different proposals, all of which in one way or another involved working with our map collections. One of the projects that we proposed was the creation of an interactive 3D uh, model for our PCL map room that we could deploy as a web app to allow folks to uh, browse for maps and to search for maps in the map room, very similar to what ASU had developed. So we had these three projects, we uh, submitted the proposal just in time, and when we uh, were paired up with a student team that had an interest in working with geospatial data and maps, um, we had our first meeting. We asked them, which of these three projects would you be most interested in focusing on? And we were a bit surprised that they actually selected this particular project. Uh, this was, um, in our estimation, going to be one of the perhaps trickiest of the projects and the one that would also require the most somewhat creative use of GIS software. So, uh, you know, we were really glad that they were interested in taking on this challenge. And so we worked with them in the fall semester on a very limited basis just to um, you know, get them prepared for accessing the, the data and the, the tools that they would need. So originally we made sure they had access to ArcGIS Pro software, uh, since that's what we envisioned using for this project based on what ASU had done and, and the technology they had used. And we were all ready. Um, at the start of uh, this year, that's that should not be January 2021. Uh, that is a typo. January 2023. <laughs> the project hasn't been going on that long. I don't know how we ended up with that uh, incorrect date in there. But uh, January of this year is when we started work on this project uh, in earnest with this student group, since that was the actual start of their capstone project period. Uh, as I mentioned here, we were initially envisioning that they would make use of ArcGIS uh, software, including ArcGIS Pro, uh, as well as the ArcGIS Online Cloud GIS platform. Uh, 
this was our original plan because uh, we, you know, realized that we only had the span of a few months uh, to, to bring this project through to completion along with these capstone students. So they would have the months of January, February, March, and April to work on this and everything had to be done in April. So we were concerned that if we were to use alternative technologies to try to build something similar, we might run out of time. If we ran into any technical hurdles, we, there was no one we could turn to, there was no example we could point to, um, to, to help us overcome some of those challenges we might encounter. So we thought we would play it safe at first and look at using ArcGIS software. Uh, what we found after doing a few uh, demo sessions with the students is that ArcGIS Pro, while it does have um, good 3D modeling capabilities and does integrate well with ArcGIS Online, did have uh, maybe a steeper learning curve than QGIS. And so we thought, you know, we've already spent a few weeks focusing on ArcGIS Pro with the students. Let's just have one quick QGIS session to see what they think. We'll build a 3D model of the PCL map room in QGIS and see if they, they think that would be a better approach. Um, and so we had that session and what we found, uh, you know, after just uh, about 45 minutes of walking the students how to use QGIS for the same thing we had shown them how to do in ArcGIS Pro, they they were sold. They really thought that that was uh, going to be an easier approach. They found it much more accessible. Some of these students were also Mac users, so they didn't have um, you know easy access to ArcGIS Pro uh, in the same way that they'd have access to QGIS. And because QGIS offers a, a few benefits, both in terms of ease of use for three D modeling, as we'll we'll see demonstrated here today, I'll uh, walk everyone through the actual process of creating. Uh, the 3D model of the PCL map room. Uh, it's also free and open source, so there was no licensing that we had to worry about. They didn't have to create accounts or um, anything like that. It's also something that the students would then be able to use after graduation, so that was a nice selling point too, that with ArcGIS Pro software, once they graduate, they lose access to that software since it's proprietary and they have access to it through UT since we subscribe. Uh, and have a license to ArcGIS um, applications, but they wouldn't be able to continue necessarily building out those skills that they um, would start developing in the capstone project once they graduated. With QGIS, that wouldn't be an issue. They can use the software um, after graduation and use it for um, anything that they might be interested in, in doing down the road with GIS. Um, and it's also cross-platform compatible, so regardless of which uh, type of computer students want to work on, whether it was a Mac, a PC, or even a Linux computer, they'd be able to use QGIS. So there were a lot of good advantages to it, um, and I, I just so happened to be a, a little more comfortable myself in QGIS uh, for this 3D modeling work. So it ended up working out. So in February, about a month, a month into the project, we decided to switch gears and go with um, QGIS instead of ArcGIS software for the modeling. Uh, once we made this shift to using QGIS and, you know, really um, were excited about uh, exploring the benefits of using open source GIS software for this, we also then more strongly considered how we could make the rest of the tech stack open source. So what we elected to do at that point was to decide on exploring a creation of a MySQL database um, that would be used to hold the map data that we needed to be able to query for um, the the search functionality in the web app and we needed a place to host that or at least the students did so we, we didn't want to set all of this up on our libraries or ut infrastructure just yet because um, we realized that getting approval for all of that and uh, you know doing things in the way that um, you know would would basically allow them to be officially put in place uh, could result in delays for the students. So what ended up happening is the students uh, created a Google trial account uh, for Google Cloud Compute, and then they were able to set up a MySQL database in Google Cloud Compute and set up a web server as well that had PHP installed. PHP, MySQL, both being uh, free and open source. Uh, we, we felt we had a pretty good, well-rounded tech stack that would allow for uh, querying map information from a database and also with PHP, it would allow us to um, uh, request data from the, the MySQL database. So we thought this was a pretty uh, streamlined and efficient uh, technology stack at the time. Uh, another advantage to this approach is that at UT, we do have a MySQL database hosting service that's offered by our information technology services department. Uh, so we felt that 
if the students were successful implementing this tech stack on Google Cloud Compute infrastructure, it would be something that would be fairly easy to migrate to our UT infrastructure at the end of the project. So again, we're really excited that we were able to come up with a tech stack that could successfully utilize uh, all open source software. All right. So uh, once we had made those decisions, um, we want to uh, spend a minute uh, here to talk about the resources we started to, to make use of. So uh, Catherine and I will, will both uh, share some information on this slide and I'll let her go first. Yes. Um... I mentioned the stack guide and the drawer labels. Those are two things. We've had multiple skifting projects in the years I've been here, um, average every three or four years. So I maintain the stack guide and the drawer label, a document to print the drawer labels and update that as we shift, you know, I maintain that. Um, and then for the each map, you know, Basically, the catalog records is what I consider where where we had the information for each item because the map room is a location within our library catalog. We use Alma Primo for those of you not at UT. Do you want to talk about the geo database? Yep. Uh, so one of the things we realized we would need in order to create an interactive three D model of the map room is we would need a an accurate layout. Uh, for that map room uh, that would have accurate measurements so that we could start to create map drawers that fit well in there and uh, lead to it being an accurate rendition of the actual physical space. Uh, fortunately, we, over the past several years, uh, collaborating on uh, the planning of GIS Day events here at UT, uh, we've established a good working relationship with the folks in our technical resources, location information services division, and we reached out to them to see if they had any floor plans already in GIS format for the PCL uh, library that they could share with us. And fortunately they did, and they were uh, willing to, to share those floor plans. So we, we, we weren't initially sure what to expect, uh, not knowing what they exactly had available, if it would be in CAD format and might have to, to convert it to GIS data, like shapefile format. Um, but fortunately they already had it in a file geo database, which we could easily work with in QGIS. So I'll, I'll show that in a demo in just a minute. Um, and in working with these uh, existing resources, we were able to uh, develop new resources. So to create some derived products, uh, one of which we'll be taking a closer look at um, when I do a demo session here in just a few minutes, that uh, is a geolocated 3D rendering of the map room and all of the map cabinets. So in addition to just having the floor plan itself, we were then able to create a new shape file from scratch representing the, the shapes and positions of the actual individual map drawers found throughout the room. So uh, the students fortunately were able to help us with that because that was a lot of work, uh, having to create all of those uh, map drawers and Catherine, if I remember correctly, they also visited the map room to measure the size of those cabinets. Is that right? They uh, so, measured, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so you know we were we were aiming to be very very accurate, right? We wanted this to again be a, an accurate rendition of the map room, so that when folks visit the virtual model and they explore it and then visit the actual space, it would it would be the layout they're already used to, right? That if they've figured out which map drawer had the specific map they were interested in, they'd be able to walk down to the first floor of PCL, walk into that space and know exactly where to go. Yeah. And um, yeah, fortunately we, we were you know very successful on the 3D modeling front as we'll see in some screenshots and in a demo here coming up. And do you wanna share anything else about the, the Alma report? Um, no, I just want to shout out our to our assessment librarian who helped me get more information out of Alma than I could myself. Thank you, Maria Chios Chios. <laughs> okay, next slide, fine. All right. We, yeah. Do you want to do you want to talk about this? Do you want me to take it? This oh, one? you can go ahead and, and take this one. So, well, I guess I'll just say that this is um, kind of jumping ahead a little bit in terms of the creation of the 3D model. So we see here that uh, the orange represents the uh, the orange floor in this space represents the data that we were provided from our location information services team on the technical resources department, and then on so that data was already in GS format. Everything else that you see here. Uh, we had to add. So the, the doors, the cabinets, the pillars, all of that was created as new shape files on top of uh, the, the floor plan data uh, that we had to work with. 
And then all of the gray cabinets there, those are within a single shape file. Uh, and actually the individual drawers uh, make up the, the cabinet. So what we're actually seeing are stacked polygons uh, that have been extruded using uh, the QGIS uh, to 3JS plugin within QGIS. So yeah, all of this was created in, in QGIS software. And then uh, Kat, I'll, I'll let you uh, talk a little bit more about the important information we had to make sure it was recorded in the, the attribute table for these map drawers. Yeah, so once they created each stack, each cabinet, so each stack of drawers is one cabinet. So they, they geolocated, they assigned a number that, you know, that's cabinet one that's circled on this. And then the top drawer is drawer one and the 14 drawers, you know, the each cabinet is one through 15 in that row, cabinet two, drawer one through 15. And then each item, you know, is I'm using that term because that's the term that I think about it as a it, within the catalog. So each item in those is a map equal equals one map. And you can go to the next one. I'll explain this a little further. So it's uh, or next slide, yeah. So I started with a giant spreadsheet um, or CSV, if you will, uh, with all of the catalog data. And, it, and I hid columns to fit just a little bit. There's a lot of data in this report. And those first three rows, or five rows really are what we is how we geolocated each individual map. Um, it's not hard. It was figuring out how to do it, and then I would describe it as tedious, but not hard at all. Um, but so they, we've got the cabinets. So we've named the first cabinet, and then we've got the first drawer, and then counting the maps in the drawer. One thing that so. My brain is, I, I would like to do the books in the map room next because they are also confusing to users. Um, and I think that would be a great proof of concept for expanding this to other collections in the libraries. Um, the, the maps are a little different because they're, they, within the drawer, are not always, we shelve the maps kind of by size. So, so they're not always, in the drawer in perfect order. They're kind of like in chunks of orders. So I didn't have to worry about sorting the maps. If we do books, we will we'll have to sort them in the proper order. Um, these are, you, you can be a little bit, they are in order, but someone might not walk in. I'm concerned with getting into the drawer. Um, but then we assign an item, then we create the CDI, which is basically, the column that is geolocating each map. That is um, the correlation there. And the label is what the user sees. So the user sees that it's drawer one. So, you know, um, that progresses, doesn't start over. We can go on. And um, you can, so we started with, uh, and Michael, you can chime in because you got the technical chat, but I'll, start with my understanding of it. So this is an a earlier screenshot. Um, there have been in some, some improvements to the interface uh, since this, but this is a screenshot. When someone clicks on a drawer, it gives them a list of the maps. Um, there's more information. And originally what was happening, I will maintain, and again, I already maintain documents when we have to shift and when we add maps to the collection. Um, I'm not usually that granular, but we don't add them at a rate where I, I can't add a few um, a month or however often we, we get maps in. Um, but so I'm used to maintaining a database about where the maps are. Um, with the MySQL database, I would just maintain that Excel spreadsheet. It's actually a CSV in Google Sheets, but um, my brain goes to Excel. I would maintain that and and they, they would, when the spreadsheet was updated, that would update the MySQL database. Uh, we figured out a quicker way to do the searching. And do you wanna talk about the JSON file now? 
Yeah, so uh, this is jumping ahead a little bit. Uh, so we're, we're, what we're showing now is the, the application as of earlier this week. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's undergone some um, improvement and further development since the students completed their work on this um, in the spring semester. And I'll just say they did an amazing job. We were extremely uh, impressed by their ability to realize the vision that we set out for them. Uh, they, at the end of the project in April, had developed the MySQL database that had been loaded with um, the map data that we were just looking at, um, that had been loaded in by a Python script uh, that was set up to run in, in the Google, co Google Cloud Compute environment to, to pull the spreadsheet data, load it into the MySQL database. Um, as of April, when the project completed, uh, you could successfully search for maps in the map room by typing in uh, you know, keywords uh, from the map title, and it would search the MySQL database, return the results, and you would see those results displayed over there in that uh, panel on the left. Um, one of the things that we were, um, one of the ways in which we were very lucky is that after the students completed their work in April, uh, Catherine and I were a little worried that now it would be up to us to, you know, finish policing, polishing everything and fixing the bugs, which, you know, there's always a few, um, and, and getting this ready for uh, production release. Uh, but the students were so interested in this project uh, that some of them actually reached out to us after the project had been concluded and wanted to continue working with us if there was an opportunity to do so. And so uh, it took us uh, about a month or so to work out the logistics of it, but we were able to uh, create student positions over the summer for two of those students that were members of the, the five-person um, capstone team. And so what they have been able to do working with uh, Catherine and I over the last uh, couple of months uh, this summer is further improve the design of uh, both the user interface and the application uh, architecture. And so we've really tried to streamline this as much as possible so that if we can avoid using a MySQL da database and having to figure out the hosting for that. Let's let's find a way to do that. Um, if we can improve the um, speed with which uh, you know we're able to uh, submit queries to find the map that somebody might be interested in, that's great. If we can uh, improve the response time of the application so that when somebody clicks on a map drawer, they see those results pop up there on the left hand side of the application that can happen faster, that's great. So we really tried to, to make everything easier to sustain in terms of the infrastructure over the longer term. And we've also tried to make um, the application more responsive and easier for end users to uh, actually utilize. And one of the other things I'll mention that happened recently is the, the free trial that one of the students uh, had signed up for through Google Cloud Compute, it had expired. And so we lost our ability to, to actually test online. And so that meant we shifted to all local development and we're trying to um, really get this to, to run again with as few technical res resources as possible. And part of that transition involved us switching from having all of the map data in a MySQL database to condensing it down to just the essential details we needed to know about each map, which we can see here um, in the lower right of this screen. So we had information about title, year, publisher, and a URL that links to information about that map in our catalog. And we save that all as one giant JSON file that has all of the data for all of the maps in the map room. And we can see the way this JSON file is organized, that one there on line two, that represents cabinet one. And so then there's a big list of all of the maps in cabinet one. If we were to scan farther down that JSON file, you'd see a list of all the maps in cabinet in, in drawer two, all of the maps in drawer three, and so on for all of the, the map drawers in the map room, which I forget the exact number, right? It's over a thousand, I think. Is that correct? Over 1,189 in the public space. <laughs> so we have a lot, right? Uh, so this ended up being a really big JSON file. And one of the things that we were uh, a little concerned about is would this really you know, hurt the responsiveness of the application? If somebody clicks on a map drawer, uh, instead of being able to query a, a database where everything's indexed and it uh, can retrieve that information really quickly, uh, are we going to see a, a slower response time? And what we found in just the last couple of days of testing, this has all uh, come together, fortunately, right before this webinar, uh, the response time is actually great. So we'll, we'll see this in a, a demo that one of our um, student workers has prepared um, for us this week, uh, showing how this runs. 
and uh, the response time is great. It's able to quickly find the information that it needs about the maps in the large JSON file. We don't and need to rely on uh, MySQL database any longer. Uh, all the, the map information, if it's updated in that spreadsheet that we were taking a look at earlier, we can just have a Python script run weekly or even daily, however often we want to, and it will uh, create a JSON um, file like we see here, deriving the updated information from that sheet and uh, spreadsheet and, and saving it out to an updated JSON file, which then will be hosted along with um, the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files for the user interface once we actually uh, push this into production and, and put it on a web server. So that's what we're looking at here is actually the, almost the latest version of this map from uh, or uh, web application from earlier this week, uh, which has seen some improvements since the, the Capstone team finished work on this in April. All right. Um, at this point, I think we're ready to maybe take a look at the process for creating the dr map drawer data in QGIS so that uh, we could then create the 3D interactive model of the PCL map room. Um, this might be a good uh, place to pause in case there are any questions anybody would like to ask at this point. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I will mention another uh, advantage of using QGIS for this is that we realized if we were successful in building uh, this web application, uh, it would be very different uh, than the architecture that ASU had utilized using uh, ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Online. And it would also be easier for others uh, who are interested in uh, creating 3D models of library spaces to use the same workflow we were using, right? In a way that it wouldn't necessarily be possible for people all over the world to make use of the exact same workflow that ASU had utilized. So uh, we thought that that was another uh, great selling point of this strategy and approach that we had taken, uh, that we could lead a webinar like this and know everybody that's attending, you can go into QGIS and create a 3D model of a space that, that you want to make available to folks online for them to explore just by following the steps that we're gonna show today. So I'm going to go ahead and jump out of these uh, slides for a few minutes, and we'll take a look at um, how we created the data for the map room. Okay, so let me go ahead and exit that. And can everybody still see my screen? We should be looking at an empty QGIS project. Um, I've lost my view of Zoom. Let's see if I yeah, can. Yeah, it looks great. Okay, great. Now I see Zoom again. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, load in the data for the PCL map room that I mentioned we were able to get from our um, location information services team um, earlier this year at the start of the, the Capstone project. And if I remember correctly, we want to bring in Spaces 01. And it's just asking me about our coordinate reference system. Fantastic. Here we see the very complex layout of the first floor of the Perry Castaneda Library. So the rooms that we are interested in in this floor plan are these two right here. So the big one that we see highlighted in yellow is the PCL map room itself. And the yellow one is the map coordinator's office or Catherine's office, which is also important because we wanted folks to know where to go if they have questions. Um, and so that space also is available um, or visible within uh, the web app that we created. So uh, what we first did is we realized we didn't want to show everybody the full complex layout of the whole first floor, right? There's a lot of rooms, and, and many of these rooms are not designed uh, for public use. Um, there are staff offices and, and sort of other purposes. So we really just wanted folks to focus on the map room itself. And so what we did is we created a derived shapefile from this. And so I'm going to just save out these selected features as a new shapefile. And I'll save that in this PCL map room folder. And I'll call this um, PCL map room and office. And we're going to continue to use the uh, NAT83 Texas Central US feet coordinate reference system. So the unit of measurement here is important uh, because that's going to affect the way in which we enter some of our attributes for these map drawers here in a few minutes. 
and all the attributes will go ahead and carry over and everything else should be good to keep with the default settings. So I'm going to hide the rest of our ECL floor one floor plan. And now we have the uh, layout of the map room and the map coordinator office. So at this point, we want to be able to create the drawers. So the drawers are really the focal point of the web app. It's you know, where all of the information is contained uh, that we want to make accessible to, to folks. And so we have to get that part right so that they can then retrieve the infer detailed information about the individual maps uh, in that JSON file we were just highlighting on the previous slide. So let me make this um, a slightly different color. So let's see if I select the symbology. We'll want the uh, map drawers to really stand out here. So I'm going to go ahead and make this a light orange color. A light burnt orange would be nice. And then on top of this, I'm going to create a new shape file. So I'm going to click on a folder here under my browser tab. And I'm going to select new shape file. And I'm going to go ahead and give this a name. And I'm going to call this map drawers. And this needs to be a polygon shape file. And then we're going to need to add some really important uh, attribute fields in order to store the information we need to actually create the 3D model. So one of the, the really cool things about using QGIS and specifically the QGIS to 3JS plugin that is really important uh, for this project is uh, we're going to use the values in the attribute table to tell the QGIS to 3JS plugin how to visualize the map drawers. Uh, so how tall to make them and how to position them vertically in space. So we need to, to make sure that we get that right. And so now we're going to need to add some uh, fields here. Otherwise, our shapefile wouldn't have any attribute fields. And I'm going to go ahead and create a field that is, uh, we'll call it position. So where is it um, in the map cabinet? Is it the first drawer, the second drawer, third drawer? I'm going to go ahead and add that to the fields list. I'm going to add another field that is height. So this would be the height of the drawer itself. Is it six inches tall? Is it nine inches tall? And that's also going to be a floating point number. And let's see, is there anything else that we need to keep track of here? Um, we'll also add label. So um, as Catherine mentioned, the label is what folks are, are using for wayfinding in the, the map room itself, right? They are told that the map that they're looking for is in drawer number 132. They navigate to drawer 132. So we needed to have that information included as well. And we could have uh, cabinet information. So what is the, the cabinet ID? So once we have all of those fields created, we can uh, go ahead and finish the process of generating that shape file. And then I'm going to go ahead and add it to my map document here. And we'll give these some realistic colors. So these map drawers tend to be a fairly dark gray color. And I'll go ahead and click apply. And so now I'm going to need to actually trace uh, the outlines of those drawers. So this is where the students uh, went in and made the measurements so they knew that the drawers are uh, two feet wide by you know this high and this deep. And so I don't have those exact measurements. So we're just going to uh, do some approximations here. But in a real scenario, if you wanted it to be accurate, you would want to know those measurements. All right, so what I'm going to go ahead and do is start editing the map drawers. So I'm going to right click on that layer and select toggle editing. I'm going to zoom in to this area. So we have a row of cabinets along that wall. And I'm going to go ahead and create the, the first drawer in the first cabinet along that wall. Okay, 
So I'm going to go ahead and start using my digitizing tools. I'm going to add a polygon feature. And over here, we have some advanced digitizing tools that if you know, you're know you pretty comfortable in QGIS, you can make use of these. Um, and this will allow you to control the, the angles you're using and snapping and, and other things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and start drawing here. And actually, get this to look a little bit nicer. So follow this wall exactly. And then it's going to snap to 45 degrees for me because I've set it up in the advanced digitizing tool to, to snap to major angles. Snaps again. And it right there. Okay, so this is going to be, remember, this doesn't actually represent the cabinet, it represents the door. Oh, and I missed the last corner of that. Sorry, I have to redo that. It looks too early. Okay, uh, so this is going to be position number one. It's going to be the bottommost drawer. Uh, let's say that the height of uh, this particular drawer is one foot. I'm just going to keep things simple here. And this would be map drawer number one, we'll say, in the map room. I'm not sure exactly what drawer this is labeled. So, again, uh, making a little bit of this up. But uh, the important thing here is understanding how these features are created in order to, to make them three-dimensional. Uh, using the QGIS to 3JS plugin. And this is in cabinet number one. Okay. So if I'm zoom out, there we see our first map drawer has been added to the map room. Um, now, what we're going to then do is select it. And I'm going to copy it. So I'm going to hit Control C and I'm going to paste it. And uh, I'm going to do that a couple of times. So once, twice, three times, four times, five times. Uh, now, you couldn't tell really that anything was happening apart from what we see indicated here that I was pasting those features. But if we look in the attribute table, what it's done is it's created six features with the exact same geometry and positioning all directly on top of one another. So we can't see that they're on top of one another visually, but once we go into the 3D mode, we'll be able to stack them on top of each other and extrude them so that they are separated in 3D space. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is start to edit the positions of these drawers. So I'm going to create drawer one, two, three, four. Oh, actually off here. So this should be drawer two, three, four, five, six. So we have our six drawers. Uh, they all are, let's say, the same height. Um, they are going to have different labels. So this would be the drawer label. So drawer two, drawer three, four, five, and six. And then I'm going to create one more cabinet. So I'm going to go ahead and save those edits. So we have six drawers all on top of one another in cabinet one. Close that down. And I'm going to click off of this, actually highlight everything. So now I've selected all six of those uh, map drawers. I'm going to copy again paste again, just using my keyboard, control C and control V. So you'll notice up here, it says six features were successfully pasted. I'm going to look back in the attribute table. And there we go. I'm going to highlight those features. So let's see if I do that. And I'll keep their position the same. Um, there we go. So those are now going to be highlighted. Pull that back up. So you see, that's why it's yellow. Two, three, four, five, and six. And I'm going to 
reduce that. And then I'm going to select the move tool. It's very small in my QJS window, but it's this tool over here where my cursor is in the top left. And then I'm going to uh, move those six drawers that I've highlighted. And I move them right here on the other side of where this pillar would appear. All right, so there I now have six map drawers um, in the first cabinet and six map, six map drawers in the second cabinet. I'm then going to go in here and edit these values so that um, the positions uh, are going to stay the same, the heights will stay the same, but the label um, and the cabinet number will change. So this will become cabinet two, cabinet two, 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 two. Oops, sorry, it's freezing there. there go. All those are in cabinet two. And then the labels, so this would be seven, eight, nine. And I'm going to go ahead and save that. And at this point, we're going to be done creating map drawers for the purpose of this demo. But what the students had to do, and again, this is why they were such a big help for us, uh, is they had to create all of the drawers uh, across the map room. So over a thousand of them, as we just heard uh, a few moments ago. So that was a lot of work. And all of the data had to be accurate. Uh, and again, they're also working with the map data at the same time that Catherine was preparing for them. So they, they really had a lot to do. They were busy this spring. And now that we have these two example um, cabinets in place, I'm going to go ahead and show the process by which we created the 3D uh, interactive visualization. So what I've already done is installed the QGIS to 3JS plugin, which is an absolutely amazing plugin, as you'll see here in a minute. I uh, definitely recommend just installing it. It's very lightweight, doesn't you know slow down QGIS or anything like that, but it's it's something I make use of quite frequently. It's a great tool for 3D visualization. It's very easy to use. Once it's installed, and you've uh, and again, it's not installed by default. You do have to go into the plugins menu to add it. Um, and just like all QGIS plugins, it's free and open source as well. You'll then find the plugin after it's installed under the web menu uh, in your top toolbar. So I'm going to go to QGIS to 3JS, and I'm going to select the exporter tool. All right, so now it's showing me kind of an empty three-dimensional view. I can't really tell what's going on just yet. I'm going to need to turn on the layers that are in my map to make them visible in this 3D view. So first, I'm going to go ahead and turn on our floor layer. So there it is. So we see the map coordinator's office and we see the, the larger PCL map room around it. And then I'm going to turn on the drawers layer. And if you look just closely there, you'll see that they're kind of flickering in and out because right now they have no height. They are uh, zero height and the same as the floor. And the floor is kind of uh, overshadowing them uh, to some extent here. So it doesn't really know how to draw them correctly. So what we're going to need to do is uh, adjust the properties of the map drawers to extrude them on top of the floor. So I'm going to right click on map drawers and select properties. And instead of representing them as polygons, I want to represent them as extruded um, features that actually have volume. And the Z coordinate here is going to be based on the position of the drawer. So if I click apply, all of a sudden we see these drawers pop out in three-dimensional space. So there are our map cabinets. Now that didn't work perfectly. There are some gaps between the drawers and you'll notice that they are floating off the ground, which that is not good, right? I mean, pretty good that we we're able to generate this all so quickly, but still not ideal, right? If we really want this to, to be uh, more accurate. So we can make some adjustments in here. Uh, so here it's defaulted to giving them a, a height of, of one foot. This is uh, where we can actually pull in the value for height from uh, the, that field that we filled in earlier. So this will set it to whatever value is defined there. So now each one of those drawers is one foot tall, which is the value we, we had set. Um, the great thing about doing that in the attribute table as opposed to setting a fixed value here is let's say we had two different types of cabinet in the map room, uh, some that had six inch tall drawers and some that had nine inch tall drawers. We can uh, basically have the, the height differential um, visually represented if we tie it to 
uh, that value in the attribute table. But here, this would apply the same exact height to all of the, the drawers across the map room, even if they're not actually the same height. So that's why it's really good to have that um, included in the data. Uh, and then let's fix that issue where they're floating in space. So here um, it says that the height above the floor is based on the, the position value in the attribute table. So remember, we set those values as one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to subtract one from that value and that adjusts it down so that it then actually thinks the first drawer is at a zero height above the, the floor in the mapper. And you can see it's perfectly matched up with the floor now. Uh, now we can't really see the drawers unless we click on them. You'll notice they're conveniently highlighted in yellow. Uh, so what we want to do here is adjust the edge color. And we can base that on feature style. If I click OK, now we see they have a black outline. If I go into QGIS and I change the colors associated with these drawers, it will also automatically reflect here. So I can make them bright red or blue or lighter colors of gray, and it would uh, update here. So that's really cool. Um, one of the other things you'll notice, in addition to being able to click on them to highlight them, there's a little pop-up that appears here in the top left. By default, it doesn't have any of the attribute information. So we want to make sure to click the checkbox here for export attributes. I'm going to go ahead and select that and click OK. And now when I click on a particular drawer, it has all of this information available within the web app. So position, height, label, cabinet, whatever else we would want to add, you know, you'd fill that in in the shape file, and then it would be accessible here in the web app when you click on the drawer. So what we're going to do next is export this. So I'm going to go file and uh, export to web. And there's a few settings that we need to adjust here. So we need to click the enable the viewer to run locally if we want to view it on my computer as opposed to putting it directly on a web server. But what's going to happen when I click export is it's going to uh, take this preview uh, for which it has generated HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files. It's going to export all of those files so that I have everything I need to, to in terms of files to put them on a web server and have this exact application be accessible online. And it just takes seconds to do it. It's really amazing how fast this works. Uh, so at this point, I can click on the link that it provides here, and it should open this 3D interactive model of the PCL map room in my browser. And there it is. So I'm in Firefox now, uh, and you can see just how I can navigate around the space and zoom in, click on the map drawers, and we see the pop-up there. So what the student team then had to do after getting through this process in the month of March was figure out how to override the default settings for the pop-up to you know, add our, our custom branding to it, uh, add the search bar, add uh, information about the actual maps that were contained, um, in the map drawer as opposed to this just generic information about the map drawer itself. So there's still a lot of development work that had to, to be done, but we were able to do so much of the heavy lifting using QGIS in the way that we just saw here in the last few minutes. All right, so that is our demo portion. I'm going to go ahead and go back to our slides, and we have a uh, a demonstration here that we can take a look at that shows uh, how the final version of this application has turned out with all of the customization on top of that uh, exported uh, 3D model that we just took, um, looked at. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and click the link here. Actually, let me go to slideshow mode and then click it. All right, so everybody hopefully will be able to see this uh, video playing. So this is recorded by one of the students, Siva, who uh, has been leading the development of the user interface for us for this project. And so again, she was one of our capstone students in the spring, and she has continued to work with us uh, over the summer. I'm really hoping this is going to start playing. Um, it looks great, though. There we go. Uh, okay. Off. All right, so we can see all of the map drawers. Uh, have been added in this model. So this is our current latest and greatest version as of just uh, late yesterday. And you can see uh, we do have situations where the map drawers are a different height. Um, so she's just kind of zooming all around, showing us how easy it is to, to change your positioning and your perspective uh, in case there are specific drawers you want to be able to click on. Yeah, and the columns, I like the columns because they're such a big part of the space. 
sorry, I'll let you keep talking about he's showing the contents of drawer of a drawer when you click on it. Yeah, and so you, again, you can see just how customized that pop-up is very different than the, the default pop-up that QJS would have created. Um, you can see how she just clicked on a link there and now she's in our catalog finding information about that specific map in a particular map drawer. Yeah, so. and making the permalink is just a matter of um, concatenating the MMS ID with that URL beginning. If anybody wants to talk about that, I didn't know that till this project. Yeah, and you can see that uh, you know all 655 maps, uh, or in this case, uh, or that was drawer 6655 rather. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the the maps that appear in that drawer then show up in the results panel and tells you how many maps are in the drawer. It also tells you the label of that particular drawer that you've clicked on. Here she's doing a search for a, a specific map. And so we're seeing a topographic map of part of Virginia, South Anna, Virginia. And another really cool thing about the search functionality is in addition to providing those details um, in the search results where you can click on and get more information, it also highlights the drawer in the map room where that map is found. So we can see that highlighted in yellow. Yeah, and changes the position a little bit. Which yeah, and so it also you know reorients you so that you're you're facing it because otherwise, as you can see, there are a lot of uh, map drawers, uh, you know, over a thousand. And so if it wasn't positioning you to it, in addition to highlighting, it might be hard to tell exactly uh, which drawer you need to navigate to to find the map. So here we can see what happens if you uh, put in a search and something's misspelled. Um, the the search functionality is still uh, a little elementary at this point because we switched over to this new JSON-based search rather than using a database. So um, it's maybe not quite as fully featured, but it's very, very fast, as you can tell, which we were a little bit worried about when we switched to this approach. And so this was just implemented within the last few days, the switch over to uh, searching through the JSON file and browsing based on the contents of that JSON file. So this is the major functionality. You've uh, seen a demonstration of browsing by just clicking on you know, random map drawers that are in the map room. And you can find out the contents uh, and learn more about what might be in them. You can also search for particular maps that would be of interest. So if you wanted to find a map of Hicksville, Indiana, search Hicksville, um, and you'd see those results come up. Um, you can see what happens here if you click on other features outside of the map drawers. Uh, if you click on the wall or the floor, it's letting you know that you have uh, clicked on something that it recognizes as an object, but there's not any information associated with it. If you click on the map coordinator office, though, you do get contact information um, that would put you in contact with Catherine so that you can reach her and get assistance. So that is uh, the, the main walkthrough of the, the demo. She's highlighting here a few of the other uh, things that are in place for um, Again, helping users understand how they can make use of the tool and what they have control over. Um, but overall, as we see it refreshing here, it loads very fast, it's very responsive, and it's really exactly what we hoped to have when we started uh, on this project and really had the original vision for this project the same time last year. So we've made some, some great progress. And I will go ahead and navigate back to the slides here. You see it's also possible to, to turn layers on and off. And I think that'll be... Yeah, that'll help with accessibility or, or usability a lot. Yeah, Making so there's really a lot of control that the users have. And there's more, we can continue to build on this. Um, the students have created this using uh, just JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and PHP. It doesn't have any you know, complex background framework to it. Uh, it's, it. And this is one of the things that we made sure to, to stress with them is we wanted it to be created in a way that uh, it would be easy for somebody else to step in and work on this without a lot of specialized knowledge. If they had a general background in web design, they should be able to start making edits and improvements to the application, which is good for Catherine and I, since you know we're, we're not professional web developers, but we do have a decent amount of web development experience. So um, we're, we're very fortunate. We have the ability to go in and, and make tweaks as we need to as well. Yeah. Um, and the code for this uh, has been shared with Catherine and I uh, through GitHub. So the students have um, been uh, versioning the code too and making sure it's, uh, accessible to us through GitHub, which has been helpful. All right, so uh, if we talk about next steps, we've made a lot of great progress in the next year, but we're not done yet. Uh, there definitely are some bugs that we still need to, to fix and resolve. We've addressed many of those since the Capstone uh, project was completed, thanks to the student assistants who 
have continued to work with us over the summer, um, but there's still other testing we need to do to make sure everything works correctly. Um, as I mentioned, we have just as of this week really significantly streamlined the tech stack and uh, been able to get the, the browsing and searching functionality to work without the MySQL database, uh, just using a, a JSON file that accompanies um, the uh, HTML and uh, CSS file and JavaScript files um, when we upload them to the web server. We, uh, as Catherine just mentioned, want to continue to focus on improving accessibility to make this uh, unique interactive web map uh, more accessible to folks who might otherwise have difficulties accessing it in their web browser. So that's something we still need to think through more. Uh, we want to develop a sustainment plan. Uh, so in addition to streamlining the tech stack to, to remove as many unnecessary pieces as possible there, we also want to make sure it's easy for us to continue to, to make edits and improvements. We recognize that the maps that are in the map room are not always going to be in exactly the same place, right? Map drawers might get shifted due to construction projects or the addition of new maps. Things are going to be changing over time, and we need to make sure the, the app is not this thing that, that can never be edited. Um, it needs to be easy to, to change in a uh, adapt to evolving scenarios. Yeah. Um, once we have worked out all of that, we'll need to migrate our files, uh, all of the, the files that the students have been working on to their uh, final infrastructure. So really, hopefully, I'm wanting us to get to the point where we just need a web server to, to make this um, you know, accessible online and don't have to worry about setting up really anything beyond that. Um, and then we'll need to get approval for a production release. So there's a formal process for, for making uh, new sites like this available to the campus community. Uh, Kat, was there anything else you wanted to highlight? No, I'm just excited to see how the books in the map room go too. Let's finish the map and then I'll get to the books in the map room. And then yeah. the world. Yeah, and so there's, that, that's another thing that we could, of course, add to, right? Um, the, the maps, and AI, we, we didn't include that here, but one of the things you might have noticed in the ASU web app is they have uh, you know, realistic looking globes and chairs and tables and other things that we also have in our map room. But within QGIS, there isn't a way to create those uh, types of objects. We're, we're stuck with uh, you know, rectangular blocks, basically. Fortunately for us, that's perfect for the shape of map drawers and cabinets. Um, but for other types of features, it doesn't work quite as well. So we should have the ability, since again, you know, we have access to all the files that have been generated by that QJS to 3JS plugin to go in and use the 3.js um, API to create new three-dimensional objects. If we wanted to use that JavaScript library. Um, so there's ways for us to be able to do that. We haven't started to explore that yet, but I think that's a, a future step too, is making it look more realistic uh, inside of the, the map room by adding those other types of features. Definitely. Um, some lessons learned here that we think are good takeaways to consider at the end of this session. Uh, we had an amazing experience working with this capstone project team. Uh, we could not have done this without them. So it really made us, I think, appreciate uh, those capstone project opportunities and, and if those come up again in the future, we really want to strongly consider are there any projects that would be a good fit uh, for students to work on uh, where they could help us accomplish something that we just don't have the bandwidth to do ourselves alone. Um, I would say it's also been a great experience, uh, at least from my perspective, Kat, working with you on this. Um, mm -hmm. it, it can be a lot to take on advising uh, capstone uh, project, especially if it's a whole team of students that you're working with. Uh, I had to be out on leave for part of the spring semester. And so I, you know, that would have really thrown a wrench in things if, if the students didn't have any supervision at that point. Um, so yeah, fortunately having a, a partner on this was, was really helpful. Um, carefully evaluating software options early on. So I'm really glad we didn't wait any longer to look at QGS than we did. We had already spent a couple of weeks really thinking we were going to use ArcGIS software. Um, and it was really at the last minute that we thought, all right, this is the last opportunity to consider QGS. And that's what the students and us too, that we really realized in that moment, this is going to be the better option for us when we did that uh, hands-on demo with them. So think about that early on, because at some point, you know, at this point, if we wanted to change our tech stack and use ArcGIS Pro instead of QGS, we would have to redo a lot of the work that we've already done. 
Um, consult stakeholders in an early stage. This is something I think we probably would have done a little bit differently if we could do this again. Uh, in, in April, as the students were getting ready to wrap up their work on the project, we did have a, a consultation with our library's IT team to ask for their input about the tech stack that we were using at that time. And fortunately, they were you know, very receptive to what we had selected and thought that it would work well. Um, and again, we had thought carefully about the decisions we were making. Um, but I, I do wish that we would have maybe talked with them a little bit earlier on to make sure, because it would have been uh, unfortunate if you know we had made decisions that were not compatible with the, the longer term vision for how these types of projects should be managed and integrated within to the you know, larger library ecosystem of web pages and, and online resources. Uh, frequent communications and meetings can definitely help avoid issues. So when we were working with the students, um, you know, initially we weren't meeting, I think, quite as frequently as we needed to. We would, you know, come into a meeting and it's been over a week since we had talked to them and they might have made, you know, or gone down a road that ended up, you know, being a dead end. Whereas if they would have come and talked to us a little bit sooner, we could have steered them, um, you know, towards a, a better option um, sooner. So I think what we eventually ended up getting to is, is more frequent communication, uh, more comfortability reaching out via email. And we were able to, I think, be more efficient with our time, especially the students were able to be more efficient with their time because they knew exactly what we were hoping to see um, and not having to, to guess quite as much or you know, work on something that, that didn't end up being what we wanted to actually implement in the end. Um, and yeah, I'll say, you know, explore opportunities for continued collaboration. Um, when those students are initially contacted us at the end of the, the spring semester, we weren't quite sure how, you know, what would be the best way to continue working with them on this project. You know, we thought it had kind of come to a conclusion, uh, but we, you know, continued to talk with them. They were just, you know, really interested and persistent, which was great. Uh, and we would not be where we're at today if we had not continued to work with them over the summer. They've really made some amazing contributions. Really can't say enough good things about that student team. Um, and really glad we've had the opportunity to continue working with them. I want to highlight their names here since they were uh, such an integral part of this project. Um, on B. Siva, Steven, Druva, and, and Johan. Um, uh, these are all, again, students in the Master's of Science and in Information Technology Management Program here at UT. Um, and uh, Monvi and Siva are the students that have continued to work with us over the summer as student assistants and have really gone above and beyond making additional contributions uh, to this effort. So, yeah. We were fortunate that they're the two people that created the technical, the programs and the two most qualified that were excited to continue to, and to have the opportunity to have them. I wanna say, I appreciate working with you, Michael. Also, I've learned a lot um, and also, this is a pie in the sky. One of those things I thought would never happen and now we're showing it to colleagues, so it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it really worked out perfectly. I think the, the way we were able to blend our different, you know, expertise and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, couldn't have done this without your essential knowledge of all of the maps in the map room and uh, all the data that you've organized uh, for those maps. Um, and of course, the, the technical capabilities of the students, uh, I mean, they they stepped in and, and they really had the know-how to, to make progress from the very beginning. So that was really great. Um, we definitely um, had a good partnership there with that MSITM program. So yeah, uh, it worked out really well. And hopefully what we are conveying through this, and one of the things I was uh, you know, really excited about when uh, we first started talking about holding the session is, uh, I hope you walk away from this feeling like you could also use QGIS to create a 3D model of a space in your library too. Um, you know, again, it's free and open source. Uh, this will be recorded and posted so that you'd be able to watch it again and kind of walk uh, through those steps one by one, um, you know, from the, the demo that we showed today. And, and of course, we're, you know, also available if you have questions and want to reach out to us, not just now, but, but at a later date, uh, always glad to share that information. And hopefully our application will will be online soon too um, for folks to, to reference and, and also be inspired by in the same way that we were inspired by the, the great work that the team at, at ASU um, had done. Okay. So at this point, I think we have about 15 minutes for questions.
So feel free to, to put any questions that you have in the chat um, or uh, un, unmute as well. Um, so I see a question from Sine. Anything you would have done differently? I'll have to, to think about that for a minute. Do you have anything that, that occurs to you? Offhand, um, I think I the data evolve throughout it. Like I would, I would be more probably succinct with the data that I started with. But I think having too much, like I can refer to a lot of it. So, no, it's great. I would have chosen the floor to be pink. I'm just saying. That's a joke. A joke. Um, Cynthia, I, do you think you will apply this to all materials in libra the library? So when we were talking, that's my dream. Um, when we were talking to the head of our IT department, he, I would, I used to see me beam when he said, "Oh, we should do this for the whole library," because you know we're constantly thinking about finding aids, and it's kind of the ultimate finding aid, getting them to the shelf that they want you know or the spot on the shelf <laughs> so let's hope let's finish this one and then hopefully we can we can move on let it grow yeah so yeah i think that there's still room for us to add additional things in the the map room right we talked about the books there i think that would be a, a great way to experiment and figure out how could we apply this to you know the, the traditional stacks that we see throughout the rest of the library space um, where we have shelves of books and magazines and other things. Um, and yeah, definitely um, we would need to think carefully about how to scale up. Uh, you know, the map room is large. We have a lot of resources there, but um, it would still be a, a very different scale. I think our approach of using geo or not GeoJSON, but JSON for holding the information about the materials that would not work uh, for all of the books in the library, I don't think. Um, maybe, yeah, that's um, but <laughs> I have a feeling that we would uh, start to, to run into issues there. So we would have to perhaps change our, our infrastructure too on the back end to accommodate that. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about what Monty's working on? Just that kind of brings it up. Like we're also experimenting with really querying our catalog and mm -hmm. um, pulling data straight from that. Um, or not directly, we'll have the list of barcodes. We do need some of the information in the interface. Um, but the other student that's working with is, on, is kind of working on options there, um, which then it might be more scalable. It might be easier to scale. Right, that's gonna be the other tricky thing here is that, um, you know, all the time, I feel like we're, we're having stacks move because of construction projects or, um, you know, new books being added. I mean, that all of the books in the libraries are, are changing uh, quite frequently in terms of where they are. You know, the um, the the books that we actually have on the shelves, right? Um, mm -hmm. And we would need to be able to make uh, very quick updates uh, very frequently so that we're not seeing our application become quickly out of date, where people are being directed to the wrong shelf or um you know the, the book that they're looking for is not there and um we we are looking at ways to utilize um the alma primo api since that's what we use for our um, library catalog to see if there's any way that we could set up the web app so that is directly communicating with the catalog to send um, up-to-date information and so that would be more important especially if we're focused on showing our regular uh, stacks throughout the rest of the library I can take Katie's question. Um, how do you deal with shifts? So uh, when I shift, I have the um, a spreadsheet basically that I use to organize the labels and actually print them. Um, so that's where I update that data. And that spreadsheet is the label column in the larger um, data set. So, so once I update the labels, then I can take those numbers and kind of shift. And I, I do have, I've had to do that, you know, since construction um, multiple times throughout my time here. So I'm pretty, it's not, again, it's, it's not something you can do in an hour, but it's very doable. And you just have to so update the label document and then change the labels 
and resort with the labels, if that makes sense. Because the drawer label, well, we probably won't move. I mean, we did move the, the cabinets, but that is a task. And we usually we shift the maps within the cabinet. So the labels and the CDI, which is cabinet drawer number, the item number is what will change, but the, uh, the rest will stay the same. So switch those and switch the item in there. I don't think I'm making sense. My nap time, y'all. I can explain it better one day. <laughs> okay, thank you, Cynthia. You're so kind. I'm happy to geek out with all of that information too, because I do have to, I, well, many of you, all of us have to deal with shifting, but I often am actually on the ground doing it um, and then relabeling. The labeling is so much more intense than this room, in this room than the other stacks in the library. Any other questions? And feel free to unmute too if it's, it's easier to ask questions. Also curious. Okay. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, uh, you know, after this, does anybody think that they might uh, try this out with um, one of their library spaces? Maybe like a thumbs up or something. Just wondering if anybody feels like this is something they'd be interested in exploring. That's great. I'm trying to figure out the not letting you mute thing. Um, did you see that, Michael? It's not letting them. Oh, unmute. yeah. Here, I click the ask to unmute button. Let's see if that works. Cool. Yeah, we can hear you. Now you're stuck with me. Okay. Um, and I, you spoke about this a bit, it, and I really think it sounds amazing. It definitely sounds like working with these students, as Kat said, like gave you an opportunity to create something that would have otherwise been not so feasible, especially in the short amount of time. Like that's kind of, that's super amazing. Um, but I was wondering how much training, and you spoke to this a bit in terms of talking about ArcGIS versus QGIS. I just wonder how much amount of training was necessary to kind of get the students up to speed on whatever various technologies you wanted them to use, or how, you know, did you have the technologies definitively in mind? Um, I know you talked about this a bit. I just was thinking a little bit about how much they drove that part of it versus how much y'all did? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so fortunately, really GIS was the only thing we needed to, to teach them. Um, all of the other skills they either already had, like they were familiar with JavaScript or PHP, um, or they had enough technical knowledge that was similar that they could very quickly pick up these new things on their own. So we didn't do anything to show them how to use Google Cloud Compute or set up a MySQL database or any of that. They were able to do all of that completely on their own. Um, so, you know, we, we said, you know, this is the technology we're hoping to see utilized. And then they were able to just hit the ground running with it. Um, with GIS, it was a little bit different since the only one of the students on the team that had any prior experience with GIS, and it was fairly limited. Um, and so, like I mentioned, initially, we started off by showing them how to utilize ArcGIS Pro, and that, you know, kind of felt like it would be a slightly steeper learning curve than we were expecting. And so that's part of the reason why we also had that um, second demo with session with them where we showed them how to create a 3D model with QGIS, and they all found that much more accessible. One of the things that they did do that we didn't highlight is they each decided to specialize in a different area on this project, which I think ended up being a really good decision. Um, so, you know, the, the students that already had previous experience 
with uh, you know databases and other back end work, they were focused on the back end students that had experience with web design and front end development. They were you know designing the user interface, and the one student that had some previous GIS experience, he was our point person for creating the three D model in QGIS, and so that worked out really well. Where I mean, he was able to get up to speed really quickly with just a oh you know really that one and maybe a second session. I forget we might have had. Uh, to review some things, but um, it really didn't take much training at all to get them um, to the point where they could uh, do this work on their own. Yeah, he had never used Key at QGIS before this, like some limited ArcGIS online, correct? I, I forget what software yeah. he had pre previous experience with. I, I, that does sound right that he had previously yeah. used ArcGIS software and the QGIS was new to him. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. Hopefully, uh, you know, this makes everyone think about these types of projects a little bit differently, and and makes it, you know, clear that at least in this case, um, you know, we were able to have a great deal of success using this approach, working with students, and using open source software, and using QGIS specifically for creating the three D models. Uh, it ended up being easier than I thought. That's for sure. Um, I mean, I know that students did a lot of the heavy lifting, but in terms of us of managing to avoid running into major technical hurdles that we really struggled to get past, um, it, it went pretty seamlessly. And um, you know, definitely over time, our tech stack has evolved and our approach has evolved a little bit. And would have been great if we would have selected like you know the best option right at the very beginning. But that's I think the nature of any project, right? You kind of learn as you go. Um, and yeah, definitely. Um, I've had a great experience with this and we'll, yeah. we'll be keeping an eye out for other opportunities that come up to, to work with uh, capstone students. And, and I think we've also learned a lot from this experience as well, just how we can help uh, coordinate things and make for an overall smoother experience working on these types of collaborative projects. So I think you know, in the future, if we were to do something like this again, it would probably be an even better experience. Definitely. I learned a lot. Um didn't seem that easy to me, but it was amazing. And the product is amazing. So, and, but I have learned a ton with this. It's great learning from students, learning from people who are born digital, um, who just know so much. So, and Michael, of course, always. Thank you all so much for coming. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, we've, we're a minute till 4.30. I uh, really appreciate everyone uh, for attending today. It's been great to, to have uh, this opportunity to present our work to y'all. Uh, again, big, big thanks to the student team. Couldn't have done it without them. And um, yeah, thanks to the TDLJS interest group for um, helping us coordinate this and TDL more generally uh, for helping us with this. And yeah, really glad um, that we could talk to you all this afternoon. Oh, also want to highlight, we have another TDLJS interest group webinar coming up uh, next Wednesday as well. That's going to be a really good one. Also, um, uh, it is QJS focused, right? I think I'm remembering that well. Uh, and uh, looking forward to that too. So hopefully we'll see you all next week. All right, well, I think we can end it here. Thanks everyone. Oh, you stop recording. <laughs>